Hey everyone, this is lecture 4.2, Mistreatment of the Mentally Ill. Uh, in this lecture, we are going to talk about uh, the mistreatment of the mentally ill, and we will also be talking about sociological commentary on mental illness. Up to this point in this unit, we've been talking a lot about uh, psychological theory and things having to do with psychology. In this bit specifically, we are talking about the sociological contributions here. Um, which is really what sociology has to add to conversations surrounding mental illness. Obviously, mental illness is the realm uh, largely of psychologists. What we do as sociologists is try to understand uh, the stigmas uh, placed on people who are mentally ill and how mentally ill people try to get through society with that label. So, uh, historically, mentally ill individuals have been treated very badly. Uh, this includes, and I'm not going to get, go into extended examples with these because these are all pretty horrific things, uh, but it includes things known as primitive so-called ice pick lobotomies, which were, um, to put it gently, very imprecise forms of brain surgery that were done in the mid 20th century. Uh, primitive electroshock therapy. Uh, electroshock actually does have a place in modern medicine, but the way, again, the, it was used in the mid 20th century was um, inhumane by almost all modern standards. The over medication of uh, many drugs, uh, including lithium, uh, conversion therapy for homosexuals. Uh, this is the kind of thing that is very much viewed as being very fringe uh, in uh, modern medicine. It still does exist in some places, but basically people were trying to ch make people not gay effectively. And uh, there is no scientific backing of that right now uh, in modern social science. Uh, where it does occur, it's almost exclusively driven by ideological factors. And then uh, women being diagnosed as being quote unquote hysterical and other sex specific disorders. Um, hysteria is one of a series of mental disorders that have been placed on women specifically, largely because uh, for the bulk of human history, uh, men just haven't really listened to women. And whenever women didn't do exactly what the men who were quote unquote in charge of them did, they got labeled with mental illness. In recent years, aw awareness of mental health issues has definitely increased dramatically. That is great. It's amazing. Uh, it is absolutely okay to get help. Uh, mental illness is very, very common. If you don't have an understanding of how common mental illness is, um, I, I assure you it is very common. You definitely know people who have mental illness and who have experienced mental illness, even if they're not that way now. However, uh, mental illness is still pretty heavily stigmatized. Uh, if it is diagnosed, people think, oh, that person is erratic or that person is potentially dangerous. If it's undiagnosed, uh, then people blame those with mental illness uh, for things that they can't really quite control. That's a, a lot of the ugliness of mistreatment of the mentally ill. So stigma uh, makes getting help for people uh, very difficult. Uh, Irving Goffman, uh, one of the early pioneers and really one of the, the greatest sociological minds, definitely one of my favorites, uh, observed that there are certain individuals in our society that uh, are stigmatized to greater degrees and mental illness, mentally ill people certainly are some of those people. Uh, with, within that stigmatization, uh, mentally ill people are portrayed as being stupid, as being unreliable, as being dangerous, as being a vast minority. It's debatable over uh, do actually most human beings have some degree of mental illness? Uh, that, that's kind of a uh, complex conversation. But what we can say is that 40% of people 
do at some point in their life uh, suffer uh, depression. Depression being uh, the most common, to the best of our knowledge, form of mental illness. And uh, society also treats people who are mentally ill as being invisible with an invisible disability. So just like uh, there are certain uh, disabilities tied in with pain, where people suffer a great amount of pain, but you don't actually see it on them uh, physically, uh, those of us who are mentally ill, and I say those of us because I am someone who suffers from mental illness, uh, people with mental illness are often not, um, they're just not seen. They're not seen for uh, the things that they suffer. Some of these uh, stigmas may apply to some people with certain mental illnesses, but they certainly do not apply to all people with mental illness. There certainly are some mental illnesses that make people erratic and unpredictable. There are some mental illnesses that make people violent. There are certain mental illnesses that, um, and it's really hard with something like intelligence because intelligence is, again, socially constructed. But there are some mental illnesses that have an impact on somebody's cognitive capacity, right? Their ability to actually process information in a way that allows them to fit in with society. Uh, my uh, sister-in-law's brother uh, has uh, pretty severe autism. And he definitely can't operate in our society the way it exists. I don't know. We don't know what's happening in his brain, right? Um, but he he can't think through in society the ways that are required to help him survive. So that um, in previous eras was seen as uh, well. Please, and this this word is. Uh, it's historic, right? And it's very ugly, but he was pre previously labeled as being retarded. Uh, that, because that was a clinical diagnosis and that's really busted too. But that um, doesn't mean anything. And it, it's just, there, there's just so much stigma tied in with mental illness, but that's how stereotypes work, right? They're a stereotype grabs something that has a little fragment of truth with it and then it spins it and spins it and spins it into a big ugly thing that that the majority of it is not true but there's a nuggle a nuggle a nugget of something in there that people latch on to in order to prop up the whole ugliness of the stigma itself as with most things, an individual's privilege definitely has a major impact on coping with mental illness. For sure, with beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you have money, if you have privilege in our society, you can get through and deal with your mental illness better as opposed to somebody who does not have privilege, who doesn't have the financial resources to be able to help it. Mental health care is expensive. Talk therapy is expensive. Uh, it, ra it really ranges. If you pay out of pocket, it can be like a couple hundred dollars a session. If you have some insurance, it's less. But some people's mental uh, health, health requires them to go through therapy once a week. And that gets, that, that's like $500 a month minimum. That, that's another bill to go along with your electricity bill or mortgage or whatever. Additionally, then pharmaceuticals cost a whole lot of money. So regardless of if people are actually doing talk therapy, which most people don't, most people with diagnosed mental illness do take some form of medication in our modern society, and that stuff too adds up. We're talking at least hundreds of dollars a year. Uh, and that's, even, that's for more treatable mental illnesses with uh, pharmaceuticals. Mental health care is stigmatized in many communities, especially those with lower levels of education. So we're talking rural areas, we're talking about uh, groups of people who historically have relatively low college graduation rates because, again, very unfortunately, we don't talk about mental health nearly as much as we should in elementary school, middle schools, and high school, our primary education. And if we did that, greater segments of the population would know more about mental illnesses as they exist. Um, 
And of course, education is one of the major ways that privilege also perpetuates. So if you are in a racial minority, you're less likely to be educated. Uh, you are more likely to have undiagnosed, untreated mental illness. It, this just creates a vicious cycle within vicious cycle within vicious cycle. Many of the problems with treating people with mental illness do stem from the fact that mental health care is embedded in the highly dysfunctional health care system in the United States especially. Uh, there are, and I have uh, seen documentation of um, better mental illness treatments uh, in uh, certain parts of the world. Uh, the UK has uh, definitely its own problems with its healthcare system, but its healthcare system does integrate mental health into the whole thing a little bit better than the American system does. Uh, we can, two big ways it does this uh, is uh, that mental health care is actually quite effective with the um, scientifically, we know what works is effectively what I'm saying, right? But preventive, pre preventative mental health care is very, very difficult to get covered by insurance, just like preventive physical health care is to get covered by insurance. Hypothetically, if we're working off evidence-based practice, your health insurance company should pay for your gym membership. That because uh, if you go to the gym, you work out regularly, that actually in the long run keeps you healthier. No health insurance company is going to actually do that. Similarly, mental health care should pay for at least weekly um, talk therapy sessions for people, but it's never going to do that. To put that into perspective, my uh, insurance company at, at this moment pays for me to have it's either four or six talk sessions a year. That's, that's absolutely unacceptable. That's absolutely not based on the actual evidence of what is required to uh, make people the best that they can be. But again, the insurance system is very busted in our country. Uh, additionally, then, another problem that happens with the mentally ill is practitioners so-called setting the table for treatment. Um, and this absolutely is a, uh, again, another vicious uh, feedback loop within the mental health care system. So in order for patients to get treatment to be covered by insurance, they have to uh, actually get a diagnosis, right? And many people with mental health care issues, their diagnosis is not super clear. This also exists in the realm of physical health care. Sure, it does. But uh, it can be murkier in terms of mental health care. So thus, many people cannot be diagnosed even if they are uh, truly ill. And this, this has a bunch of uh, ramifications. So we can't get a diagnosis on you, so you can't get your help. But then also, on the other hand, if I just grab something to diagnose you with, but it's a wrong diagnosis, if you decide to change therapists or change practitioners or whatever, they may refuse you care that you actually need because it doesn't match your previous diagnosis. That's also very deeply busted. The, additionally, the mental health, the mental medical model uh, interprets mental illness as being similar to having physical disease. And to a certain degree, uh, it, um, it is biochemical. There, there are chemicals in a lot of our brains that make our brains operate differently. Uh, than other people's brains. You, but in the medical model, you could say incorrectly or sickly, right? And the shift from mental, mentally sick to neurodivergent is kind of a cultural thing we're doing right now. Um, as somebody with ADHD, I far prefer the label neurodivergent, uh, even to the label of ADHD, because ADHD does not describe uh, certainly my behavior. Um, 
Thus, though, if we treat it as if it is a physical disease, it assumes that disorders are identifiable with diagnosable causes, just like physical diseases. And that works for some things, but with other uh, mental illness, say mental illness that's caused by trauma, say mental illness that's caused by continuing trauma, so say uh, an abusive spouse, or a very ugly work situation, well, that individual is not going to get better until they get out of that unhealthy work uh, social situation as well, right? So uh, it may be more helpful for someone, for example, who is in an abusive relationship uh, to help that person be able to escape that relationship as opposed to medicating them, right? And as, as I alluded to a, a couple times on this slide, uh, the physical model does work for a lot of illnesses, uh, specifically schizophrenia. Uh, people who are uh, truly schizophrenic, if they take their pills, they're pretty good. Uh, for me with some of my anxiety stuff, if I take my pills, that symptom goes away. But there are still certainly other things uh, with my life and probably with some of yours, statistically I know this, uh, that that stuff doesn't go away just because you take pills. Um, but the pills are critical. Don't get me wrong. Never stop taking your pills without talking to a doctor. A major flaw in the American medical s mental health system is that we, we lack mental hospitals and other mental health treatment uh, centers. We have some, we have a very, very few, but to put it into perspective and compare to our uh, physical healthcare system, there is nowhere to go uh, to be treated for, I guess, the equivalent of like stitches, right? Or something that needs to be taken care of uh, that, um, in kind of a short-term sense. All we really have is mental health care for people who are wildly mentally ill. And by the time you get to that point, you definitely have caused a lot of damage both to yourself and probably those around you. Uh, this is a big, big problem. And so thus, the way the system exists, only people who are either a danger to themselves or other people or who are entirely non-functional, only those people get the ability to be in inpatient treatment facilities for mental illness. And that's, that's pretty wild in and of itself. Uh, so there is a big reason for that though. Before the 1980s, we did have widespread mental health hospitals. We did, they, they were around. There was at least one in every even medium city, multiple in each major city. Uh, however, those mental health hospitals were really very severely busted. Some of them absolutely were places just to lock away people that uh, people just didn't wanna deal with. And that, that it was a different form of ugly. However, when those were so-called reformed in the 1980s, basically what happened was those facilities shut down and new facilities were never created in a way that would actually be able to fix people. And actually, this is, this is also deeply disturbing. Um, we did not have before this moment in our history, the levels of homelessness that we have today. A significant portion of people who are homeless in our cities and country areas too, are homeless because they do not have the uh, mental stability that's necessary to actually um, to, to live on their own like that. And a mental health hospital might be able to fix them in that way, or at least help them. Um, really, again, tremendously sad stuff. So now let's look at some of the sociological commentary on mental disorders. Uh, identifying and studying mental disorders is primarily the realm of psychology, as I alluded to. However, due to the social dynamic created by mental illness, sociologists 
also have valuable insights on mental disorders. So many socio social factors have been studied as they relate to mental illness. Uh, class differences absolutely impact how people can get uh, help for their mental illness. Gender differences have a big impact there. There certainly traditionally have been certain mental illnesses that have been put on women more than they've been put on men and certainly been put on uh, non-binary people more than they've been put on uh, men or women. Uh, age differences, this is, this is uh, complex. We often see teenagers as having greater degrees of mental illness, but certainly people of all ages have the capacity to be mentally ill. Uh, there are also within age generational differences, right? Those people of the baby boomer generation are probably less likely to seek out mental health care as opposed to those of us who are younger who actually recognize this because the science was better developed as we were growing up. Uh, race and ethnicity has a big part to play. Uh, there are sometimes stigmas within racial communities uh, along the lines of, well, mental illness, uh, that's, that's a white people thing, right? Or that's not for us, right? That, uh, then this is speaking from a minority perspective, and yes, I'm absolutely very white. But I've heard these, I, I've talked to people, these are conversations that exist. Uh, urban versus rural environments. So people who are in urban areas uh, often have greater access to mental health resources. Additionally, people in urban areas tend to have higher degrees of education because it was available to them. Thus, they're more likely to get their help and there's less stigma on it. Rural areas uh, have fewer resources for those people who are mentally ill. Mental disorders have been historically used to discriminate against minority groups additionally then, right? So uh, again, stigma is complex, right? And so thus uh, there was definitely, for example, historically uh, people uh, as part of racist attitudes toward black people thought that they were intellectually inferior right and certainly that would have tied into the broad ugly mental health issue of people thinking well if you were smart then you were mentally healthy which again does not work um but again if you have uh, a stigma against a certain group of people you definitely there are elements that of mental illness that have been inflicted on those people is basically what i'm getting at uh, so moving on, when we stu study mental health across societies, we often see that mental illness can vary from culture to culture. And this is really interesting from a sociological standpoint. Uh, when we study mental illness, it does not discount the suffering of those who have these uh, problems, but it does point to the fact that both our perceptions of ourselves and others are a matter of social construction. So effectively what we're saying here is um, different societies uh, label mental illness in different ways. And some of our mental illnesses in our societies may be the result of things that we, that people in our society focus on as opposed to people in other societies. That's kind of what we're getting at here. And that's a, that's a big complex idea, right? Uh, this is tied in with a concept known as psychiatric imperialism, which I didn't give you a definition for. I know it's in your textbook, but let's do it really kind of quick and ugly right now. Um, psychological, psychiatric imperialism is basically the concept of saying, it's, it's very similar to the concept of ethnocentrism. So basically saying that your society is the one that understands mental illness the best. And if there is a mental illness in your society, then that means it must exist in all societies. And if there is a mental illness in another society that is not in your society, then that mental illness must be made up or imaginary. That's, that's basically the concept of psychiatric imperialism. 
Uh, oh, there's the definition that I want, and I think that's just about right. Uh, discounting and disregarding mental illness simply because they do not exist or are not recognized in your society. Ap actually, the definition I just gave is a little bit better than this definition, but that's a good one too. Uh, we may, uh, it may be beneficial for us to adopt what we call transcultural psychiatry. Uh, and this is kind of a big uh, revolutionary, not really mainstream idea yet. But as we move on through the century, we probably are going to become more transcultural with our psychology, uh, psychiatry, sorry. Uh, uh, I don't know if I've defined it yet. Psychiatry is the study of those biochemicals in the brain. Psychology is more about uh, studying uh, the more social elements of uh, our individual interactions with others. That's what psychology is. Psychiatry is about the stuff that happens in the brain. Anyway, the definition of, I, I already did that. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. The ADHD is kicking in. So here are some mental illnesses that are um, present in other societies that are not present in American society typically. Uh, for example, in South Korea, people are quite afraid, it's, it's a phobia, that running fans in bedrooms will cause suffocation. Right, And so thus we take this back to Thomas theorem. If you define a situation as real, it is real in its consequences, right? As a result, people will not have running fans in their bedrooms, for example. While in, in America, a lot of people need kind of the noise of a fan to sleep. That's not really something in uh, South Korea. It's actually the exact opposite. They might be afraid of that fan. Similarly, it's also thought in Germany and other parts of Central Europe that having a fan in a window while sleeping is unhealthy. Uh, in, if you go to some hotels uh, in Europe, uh, maybe that might not even have air conditioning, they uh, have their windows like painted and even nailed shut so you can't open them. It's because in those societies they feel that air currents are somehow dangerous when you're sleeping. Um, which again, that's just a, a big cultural difference. It's a cultural phobia that we just don't have in our society. Here are uh, some additional uh, mental health issues. I'm gonna do my best to pronounce these knowing what I do about these societies. Uh, this is probably pronounced Kufung is Isissa. Kufung Isissa is probably how you say that. Uh, this is anxiety, depression, panic attacks, and irritability that are caused by, quote, thinking too much, right? Which is a very interesting concept, right? That almost could plug in to our concept in the West of a generalized anxiety disorder. It could, but they think that if they think too much, then that would cause anxiety and depression too, which is almost exactly the opposite of things like ADHD, where, well, I uh, have a mental illness, so thus I think too much almost. That's one way of viewing ADHD. Uh, they think that if they think too much, they get the mental illness. Uh, again, this because this isn't in our mental illness lexicon doesn't mean it doesn't exist for some of those people. Uh, susto is a Latin American illness uh, precipitated by a frightening event that causes the soul to leave the body. We in uh, modern medicine don't really think about the soul too much when we're talking about mental illness, right? Uh, but um, again, this is real for those people. So it can be uh, tied in with a loss of appetite, excessive sleep, that should be sleep, not slept, uh, sadness, low self-worth, all of those are depression symptoms, aren't they? Uh, it would be easy to say that this thing is depression, but that would be culturally imperialistic, right? There are certainly, I'm sure, nuances here that make this different other than depression. Probably the precipitating frightening event. That usually, trauma doesn't always cause 
depression, it's it's clearly, I would have to dig deeper into it to really be able to point out the differences, but it's a really good example of a tendency we could have just to label something different in a different society as a label that we have for it. Hora, this is an interesting one. Uh, also known as Dot Syndrome. Uh, this is found in South China, where they call it Doro, and Dot that they call it in India. This is actually a fear that is present in many societies. It's just not present in Western societies, so European and American aligned societies. Um, in males, this is classified by an intense anxiety that the penis will withdraw into the body and that will cause death. So, and there are many variations on what that could look like. Uh, it could be kind of a bio, and again, all of this is not reality, it's a mental illness, right? Uh, it could be the person just thinks that their genitalia are going to disappear. It could think that they think it's going to get reabsorbed into the body. And that in and of itself would be a cause for, for fear, right? Or it could, but also that would cause death as well, that, that process. There is a female correlation, a fear that the vulva and nipples will recede into the body and that will have a deadly effect. Uh, that is really, really interesting. Uh, there is no medical uh, research to show that, I mean, it, it, it's just not something that happens. This isn't something our body does, but this is a very real thing for those people that suffer it, right? That's always important to note. And it's also important to note from a folklore and historic lens on a global scale, even to this day, there are accusations of so-called witchcraft and penis stealing in some societies uh, that um, that ties in with this concept too. So if you're suffering from Koro and you're in a society that accepts the existence of uh, witches that steal penises, you could blame it on a witch then. Uh, that doesn't, again, th these th society is complex and us humans are dynamic, weird creatures. As mentioned previously, uh, and this is kind of the part of the book I, I'm not fond of, uh, the author uh, likes to apply sociological analysis to the Trump administration. Uh, also, uh, as I've mentioned previously, I think it's still too early, even though we're a couple years out from uh, Trump's uh, being president, at least the first time. Um, it, it's still too early to truly understand that presidential administration. Um, I personally, as a sociologist and as a semi-amateur historian, I, I've done a little bit of professional historian work, um, I think you need at least 10 years to fully process a historic event. Um, we certainly didn't understand 9-11 in the year 2005, um, so, I, so for what that's worth. But his conversation about understanding the role of, of how mental health impacts people who are running society, that is a, a useful conversation there. Uh, that's why I included it in this uh, presentation. So specifically in the chapter, uh, the text asserts that Trump is a narcissist, which uh, I think is a valid uh, it's a it's a valid interpretation. I think you could also make a valid interpretation that most presidents, to a certain degree, are narcissists. It takes a certain type of individual to want to be president, to think you are capable of being president, and most of us aren't that individual. But this ties in to two social uh, elements known as the Tarasov rule and the Goldwater rule which are uh, contradictory to each other. The Tarasov rule states that uh, a profession, the professional conduct of psychiatrists requires that uh, they assess threat potential of an individual, not just their degree of mental illness, so that they can warn others who may be in danger. So it is part of being a therapist to 
be confidential for your patient, and that's part of it too, but if you think that patient is actually going to hurt somebody else, you have to warn that person, right? Uh, so you could see how if you're a psychiatrist, you could make an argument, or psychologist actually, uh, you can make an argument that it could be your duty if you identify this in a public figure to warn them. However, that conflicts with the Goldwater rule, which forbids psychiatrists and psychologists from diagnosing anyone who they have not personally examined in a clinical setting. So that lines up with um, an abundance of data. Uh, that, 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 that's, a pro that's a problematic concept because certainly in our modern media landscape, we have, we know so much about politicians, right? And arguably in the modern media landscape, there's more information for a psychologist than even there would be on their direct patients. So you can make an argument that if a large number of psychologists agree that a certain political, um, a certain political figure is uh, exhibiting uh, indicators that they are indeed mentally ill and mentally dangerous, then they have the duty to warn the American public. But then also um, you can make an argument that that uh, isn't really fair. Uh, it's, 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 it's a complex dynamic. It's a very complex dynamic, very interesting dynamic. And this lecture has gone on, I see, for about 37 minutes. So I'm going to cut it off here because I'm trying to keep these relatively short. Uh, if you have any questions uh, on anything, absolutely feel free to contact me. Thanks.